the boat with the hired men and follow Jesus, the gospel of our Lord. Thanks. Please be seated. When you, uh, when you tell fish stories, you have to have your hands available, right? <laughs> fish stories always involve hands. So, Have you ever listened to a fisherman tell a story? <laughs> yeah. Usually they're about what? The one that got away or the one that was a whopper, right? Yeah, of course. So. Sometimes I think the fishermen are setting you up in a way that, like with a twist at the end that you just didn't see coming. Well, we have two of those stories this morning. The first one, the first one is from Minnesota, right? When Sharon and I were first married, she was a nurse up on the medical floor of a hospital. I was a surgical orderly uh, down in the surgery wing of the hospital. And one of the older orderlies that I worked with loved to fish. I mean, he talked about that a lot. He loved to fish. That's a good Minnesota thing to do. 15,000 lakes, actually, not just 10. But he loved to fish, not for bass, not for walleye. I mean, those are good Minnesota fish. He liked to fish for muskie. How many of you know what a muskie is? Ah, uh -uh, Midwesterners. <laughs> a muskie is a muskellunge. Big ones grow about five feet long and weigh about 70 pounds. And uh, you might think of them as a freshwater barracuda, right? Well, that's the fish that Bob loved to fish for, only that. So one weekend after I knew he had gone fishing, I said, so Bob, how did you do? And he said, oh, great, I got one, just one. And then he goes like this. And I said, uh, uh, Bob, that's, uh, that's kind of small to brag about, isn't it? And he goes, no, that's the distance between its eyes. <laughs> he set me up for that one, right? And, and I didn't see it coming. So you heard the first lesson. And I, I suspect you've heard that story of Jonah since you were uh, as young as our candle lighter right? Uh, and I'm sure you think you know the story, but I think maybe there's some twists and turns in here that we should spend some time talking about. So, you know it as the story of Jonah and the... Okay. The first twist <laughs> is that a whale is a mammal, and the story talks about a big fish, right? So, maybe we should say this is the story of Jonah and the great white shark, or Jonah and the Minnesota muskie, right? It wasn't a whale if it was a fish, right? Well, again, I'm assuming you know the story, but I'm gonna tell it to you in this way. Jonah was told by God, man of God that he was, to go to that great wicked city of Nineveh and tell them what? Time is short. They get ready for destruction, right? They were sinful. Nineveh, if I'm Jonah, Nineveh is east. Which way does Jonah go? West, west right? Yeah, as far and as fast as he can. He runs down to the shore at Joppa, which was a distance for him to travel, buy his own, buys his own ticket and gets on a boat to go as far and fast as he can away from God and God's command. Now, I wouldn't have seen that one coming, right? God says, do this, and you say, bye, right? <laughs> Didn't see that coming. But maybe we should have. It seems to me Jonah, in response to that command to go and tell, is a little bit like most Lutherans, right? That's how... It's how we do evangelism, right? <laughs> Told to go and tell, we prefer to say God. Well, we prefer not to tell, and we certainly aren't going to go, right? I shared with a few in tech study that there was a study maybe 15, 20 years ago about Lutherans and evangelism. And they found out uh, this about Lutherans. 
We invite others to come into our faith community. How often? Once every other Sunday. No. Once every 26 years. If we tell at all or invite at all, right? Wow. Uh, Jonah hits a little too close to home here. But back to the boys in the boat, right? Suddenly the ship that Jonah is in is in rough waters, big waves, high winds. The story says that the, the Gentiles, sailors, those heathens, all pray to their own gods for deliverance. The story says it doesn't help. So the ship's captain combs through the whole uh, ship, goes way down to the bottom and finds Jonah asleep during the storm. He says to Jonah, you know, get up, come up here with us. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, your God will have a change of heart and save us from this storm. Tells him, get up here and pray to your own God. So Jonah goes up. Storm gets even worse. So the sailors are now really panicking. They sort of draw straws to see whose fault this is. You should have seen this one coming. Who drew the short straw? Jonah. Jonah. So the sailors ask him, well, who are you? Jonah. Where are you from? Israel. Well, who's your God? And Jonah says, the Lord creator of heaven and earth, land and sea, right? Then he says, this is my fault. In order to stop the storm, you should throw me overboard. Well, you might not have seen that coming. But here's another twist. The story says that these heathen Gentile sailors don't pick up Jonah and throw him into the sea. These boys in the boat grab their oars and they row even harder, trying to save everyone and get them to shore. Even Jonah, whose fault it is, right? Pretty gracious. It seems that they won't give up, they won't give in, and they go to work. Finally, though, finally, they uh, throw Jonah overboard. Now that could be the end of this fish story, right? Well, here's another twist. These heathen Gentile sailors start praying to Jonah's God. They ask God for deliverance. They ask God for forgiveness. They offer up sacrifices to the God of Jonah. They make vows to the God of Jonah. The story says they all repent and believe in Jonah's God. Now, none of us would have seen that coming, for sure. Now, here comes a, a fishy part again about that whale. Whales are what? Mammals. Fish are not. So, it's about a fish. So, it seems to me that we should think of that big fish as kind of a, a salty Uber taxi. <laughs> well, that, that God sends to get Jonah from the water back to the shore, right? Now, we, we call this a story, but it's really a sermon. And it's a Jewish sermon on the lack of Jewish evangelism, right? They have a God they're not willing often to share, certainly not with Gentiles. This time, Jonah's on the shore. He goes five, six hundred miles to get to Nineveh. It's a long trip, but he gets there. He walks in part way, says about a third of the way. It's three days across, only if you hit every bar in town, but he, <laughs> which sailors might do. But he goes in a third of the way, and he stands on one street corner, and in Hebrew he says four words that sort of translate in English to this. Forty days, Nineveh's toast. 
He says it one time. Then he turns around and he walks out of the city and he climbs up on a hill as if to wait and watch for God to rain down fire from heaven on Nineveh, right? By now, we probably should have known something like that was coming. But here's the thing. I think both us and Jonah have been set up with still another twist to the story. You see, in Nineveh, everybody repents. If you had the whole story, it says everybody in Nineveh repents, including the cows, right? <laughs> this preacher is having fun with the story, right? What they do in Nineveh, from the king on down, is they all strip naked, put on gunny sacks, dump ashes over their head as a sign of repentance, and again, the cows do that too. And the twist is, God also repents. Right? God changes God's mind and doesn't do what God said God was going to do. He sees their change of behavior, their change of heart, their change to faith. It says everybody believes in Jonah's God. Now, none of us could have seen that coming. But here's the thing. Jonah saw that coming all along. That's why he ran this way when God told him to go that way, right? Jonah wants God's justice poured out and not God's mercy. He says something like, God, I should have known you'd pull a stunt like this, right? I just knew you would save them from destruction. It's just not fair. God, that's so you, right? So where are we? The sailors repent and come to faith. The king and all the people, the cows and horses and chickens, the camels, the cats, the dogs, the goldfish, probably even vegetables, come to repent and come to faith in Nineveh, but, but it's never certain that Jonah does. He's so mad at God, sitting on this hillside in the hot, dry sun and wind. He's so angry he wants to die. And then the story takes another twist. He's sitting there. And in one day's time, God raises up this big plant with the big leaves to give Jonah shade, right? Jonah loves it, loves that God was so merciful to him. He sits there. And then that night, God raises up a worm to cut the plant and have it fall over. And Jonah gets up the next day and he is so angry about life and God, he wants to die again. He's angry that that has happened, right? Hmm. Once more, so that we don't miss the point of the writer's sermon here. God invites repentance and faith. And faith is a gift, and repentance is a gift. He invites everyone to show love and mercy. Those heathen boys in the boat come around to faith. Every living thing in Nineveh comes around. Even God comes around, repenting of his plan to destroy. Everybody repents in this story, including God. But maybe not Jonah. We're never told what his response is to God's last question. You know, this is the only book of the Bible that ends with a question and not some kind of answer. Right? So, another strange twist. Again, what was it that got Jonah so upset? Well, we should have seen this coming if we know Jonah's God. Jonah says towards the end of the story, For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Abounding in steadfast love. Ready to relent. Ready to repent from punishing such grace and mercy for Jonah were more than he could bear, right? 
It was more good news than Jonah was willing to share, certainly with an enemy. Now, here's the thing. In a lot of ways, isn't that much like us too, right? The story of Jonah is a sermon on God's people, the Jews, hesitation, their refusal to share a gracious God with all those around them. Isn't that kind of like us, even to this day? Listen to the very end of this story. It's the only book of the Bible to end with that twist, with an open-ended question. I think, I believe, God sets up Jonah and us this morning for our response. God says to Jonah, you know that shade plant that grew up that you had nothing to do with, and then it died so quickly, that is what breaks your selfish heart? Should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 100,000 people, 120,000 people, who don't know right from wrong, left hand from right hand. Should that, and all the animals, he says too, should that not break my heart? That's the end of the story. We should have seen that coming if we know Jonah's God, right? Here's the deal. Should not a world like this break our heart too? A world that needs to hear the good news of a gracious, merciful, loving, forgiving, compassionate God who longs for the whole world to be turned in repentance and come to faith. While we, often most like Jonah, sit on the sidelines or silence our voice, or close off our hearts, or prefer to run in just the opposite direction. Again, if you ever invite a Lutheran to do evangelism, <laughs> they're out the door, right? There's something fishy <laughs> about a response like that before a gracious God. Question is, Will that be the end of our story too? A once in 26 years willingness to share the goodness of God with others by inviting them? This sermon ends, this sermon ends with that question too. It begs the question of our own repentance. To whom do we belong? Jonah? Or Jesus? And who in the world will we tell? Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, <laughs> every day, every moment. Keep your hearts and minds and voices in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.